Some 6,000 women served as nurses in Vietnam. Dealing with death was their regular routine. When you are sitting there working on someone in the middle of the night, and it's a 19-year-old kid who's 10,000 miles from home, and you know that he's going to die before dawn, you're sitting there checking his vital signs for him, and hanging blood for him, and talking to him, and holding his hand, and looking into his face, and touching his face. And you see his life just dripping away. And you know he wants his mother, and you know he wants his father and his family to be there. And you're the only one he's got. I mean, his life is just oozing away there. Well, it oozes into your soul. There is nothing more intimate than sharing someone's dying with them. This kid should have a chance to grow up and have grandkids. He should have had a chance to die in bed with his loving family around him. Instead, he's got this second lieutenant. When you've got to do that with someone and give that person at the age of 19 a chance to say the last things they are ever going to say, that act of helping someone die is more intimate than sex. It's more intimate than childbirth. And once you have done that, you can never be ordinary again. Discontent in the United States grew in 1968. The public lost faith in the Johnson administration's handling of the war, convincing the president not to seek a second term. The ensuing presidential campaign demonstrated the division in America over the war, culminating in violence at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. By July 1968, troop levels in Vietnam had reached 550,000. College campuses became the focal point for many anti-war demonstrators. Marjorie Swan offers a glimpse into one protest. It was a beautiful sunny day on October 16th on the Boston Common. I walked around with a sign, watching between four and 5,000 people assemble for the ceremonies known as the Resistance. An attractive blonde woman carried a sign. LBJ killed my son. Amid some heckling, the speeches got underway and professors, clergymen, and young resistors gave their reasons for resistance. We lined up then, the young men and clergy first, and walked the long way around the common to Arlington Street Church, which has a history of harboring war resistors. There were so many of us that at least a thousand stayed outside, lined along the sidewalks, listening through loudspeakers placed on the spire of the church. Perhaps what was the most exciting for some of us was the sense that the church was finally coming into its own, doing what a church and its representatives should be doing in a society racked by violence and injustice. The Reverend William Sloan Coffin, chaplain of Yale University, offered on behalf of a number of clergy to provide sanctuary in the churches and synagogues to draft resistors. Then draft age men were invited to come to the altar and turn their draft cards into representatives of various faiths, including humanist and atheist, or to burn them in the flame of the altar candle. A moment of silence called in memory of all the victims of war even brought silence for at least half a minute from the right-wing hecklers and multitudes of police standing out on the street corners with us. Approximately 180 young men turned in their cards and 80 more burned theirs. A final hymn and carillon chimes ended the service and the young war resistors filed out of the church to the applause of the outside listeners. Maybe this is a beginning of fulfillment of the old adage. Wars will cease when men refuse to fight. Don't these anti-war protesters realize they are giving the enemy real comfort and support? Anonymous U.S. infantrymen recovering from battle wounds. By the mid-60s, Americans were deeply divided by the Vietnam War, and some soldiers who were called to serve felt deserted by the American people. Dear Angela, this is by far the most difficult letter I shall ever write. What makes it so difficult is that you'll be reading it in the unhappy event of my death. You've already learned of my death. I hope the news was broken to you gently. God, Angie, I didn't want to die. I had so much to live for. You were my main reason for living. 
Please don't hate the war because it has taken me. I'm glad and proud in that America has found me equal to the task of defending it. Vietnam isn't a far off country in a remote corner of the world. It's Sagamore, Brooklyn, Honolulu, or any other part of the world where there are Americans. Vietnam is a test of the American spirit. I hope I have helped in a little way to pass the test. The press, the television screens, the magazines are filled with images of young men burning their draft cards to demonstrate their courage. Does it take courage to flaunt authorities and burn a draft card? Ask men at Doc To, Con Tien, or Hill 875. They'll tell you how much courage it takes. Most people never think of their freedom. They never think much about breathing either, or blood circulating, except when these functions are checked by a doctor. Freedom, like breathing and circulating blood, is part of our being. Why must people take their freedom for granted? Why can't they support the men who are trying to protect their lifeblood, freedom? Patriotism is more than fighting and dying for one's country. It is sharing the never fully paid price of freedom which was bequeathed to us who enjoy it today. Not to squander, not to exploit, but to preserve and enhance for those who will follow after us. Just as a man will stand by his family, so will the patriot stand where Stephen Decatur stood when he offered the toast. Our country, in her intercourse with foreign nations, may she always be right, but our country, right or wrong. I want you to go on to live a full, rich, productive life. I want you to share your love with someone. You may meet another man and bring up a family. Please bring up your children to be proud Americans. Don't worry about me, honey. God must have a special place for soldiers. I've died as I always hoped, protecting what I hold so dear to my heart. We will meet again in the future, we will. I will be waiting for that day. I'll be watching over you, Angie, and if it's possible to help you in some way, I will. Feel some relief with the knowledge that you filled my short life with more happiness than most men know in a lifetime. I love you with all my heart, and my love for you will survive into eternity. Your Joey. Joey Santoni died on March 27, 1968. We have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. On November 13, 1982, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was dedicated in Washington, D.C. The wall includes the names of 58,000 U.S. soldiers who were killed in Vietnam. Friends, families, and fellow soldiers leave mementos at the wall in honor of the dead.